Good evening. Won't be able to say that much longer. It'll be good morning, right? You excited about going to Sunday mornings at Easter? I think we are. We're just believing God for great things on evenings like this when it's so beautiful outside. Uh, it'd be nice to have church on Sunday morning and cook out on the grill on Saturday night. So maybe we'll do both as we go forward. I'm good with that. You heard the announcement. So many services this year at Easter uh, with all the services and all the campuses, it just makes more room for each and every one of you to express the gifts that God has placed on the inside of you. And we really believe that as a part of our mission is not just to see people born again and come into the kingdom, but to help equip and empower every believer to do what God created them to do, to do what God created you to do. And so many times those gifts and talents kind of stay suppressed. We either suppress the giftings on the inside of us Others may have suppressed them by what they've said or what they've implied, or maybe it's just the work of the enemy saying, oh, you're not good enough and you're not qualified, but you were created for a purpose and God wants to use the gifts that he's placed on the inside of you, the talents that he's put on the inside of you. He doesn't want them to stay buried. He wants them to be released and invested in the lives of others. And so I encourage you, if you've got a gift of any kind, you need to let God begin to use those things. Uh, to bless him and to bless others. Amen. It was great to have uh, uh, Jason and Stephanie and Robert leading worship for us tonight. Beautiful family, very gifted family. Their parents are here uh, from uh, Wisconsin. The reason I remember that is because they bring some cheese down every now and then, and it's amazing. So if you want some cheese, you need to be friends with them real quick before they go back. They're going back this weekend, but uh, Good to have you guys here. Thanks for being here. It's always fun. And I, I love seeing families like this sharing their giftings. You know, I was talking about sometimes these things lay dormant. This morning we were at a men's breakfast in Cleburne, and a young man that's been serving around the church for the last three or four or five years uh, and, and done many things shows up this morning with his guitar and just leads us in an amazing worship set. I'm like, I didn't even know you knew how to sing, definitely didn't know you knew how to play, and you just got up there by yourself and led the whole worship set. I'm like, where have you been? He's like, well, I laid it down six years ago, and I just haven't done anything with it. I'm like, well, pick it back up. My goodness. And so it was fun, fun to be a part of that. Turn with me uh, today to James 1 and Mark chapter 8, if you want a few places to start. And we're going to talk about communication, uh, because communication is one of our core values here at the Heights, and clearly... Um, healthy communication is so important uh, for all of us as believers. If, if we get uh, anything we struggle with within the life of the church, many times it's just not good, clear communication. We, everybody needs communication. We, I thought I told you, or uh, we said it one way, but they didn't hear it that way that we said it. And so communication be, can be a trouble uh, spot. It can be trouble between marriages, you know, where there's just not great communication. It be trouble among employers, employees, when that communication begins to break down. And Pastor Daniel has done a great job of sharing on being quick to listen. Um, and we would all be better off if we listened more. Amen? I, I, I'm guilty. I like to talk probably too much. And I catch myself carrying the, be the biggest part of most conversations. I have a lot to say. I mean, I've <laughs> seen a lot, done a lot, right? I, just, I get excited about things and I look up and I've carried on most of the conversation. But we'd be better off if uh, I talked less, uh, if we talked less and listened more. James 1.19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And so what we need to be good at is listening. We need to be really quick at listening and listening maybe longer than normal and then being very slow to speak. My wife often tells me when I'm preaching, slow down. You're talking too fast. You're going just 90 miles an hour and you get a lot of great things, but you're saying them so fast that we can't hardly keep up with you and we're trying to just listen to what you have to say, but it's so exciting that you're excited, but we're trying to be excited, but we can't keep up with slow down. And that's, it's hard, right? It's hard for me. It may not be hard for you, but I'm purposing to slow down, to listen more and to talk less. Man, I could have saved myself a lot of trouble throughout my lifetime just holding back a few of those words that I let release. Amen? Mark 8, 31, Peter's probably got some of the same issues that I have in the sense that he's got something to say. Maybe it's not always the right thing to say. Maybe he says it without thinking. 
Mark 8, 31, he says, And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Listen to this. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Wait, wait a minute. Jesus steps up in front of all his disciples and says, guys, this is what's about to happen. Now, he's been telling them this for a while now. It's just not really sinking in. But openly and very clearly, he tells them this is what's about to happen. Peter's so caught up in that's not going to happen, that we're not going to let that happen. So he's already probably in his mind thinking about what I'm about to tell Jesus. So that when Jesus quits talking, Peter gets up and says, Jesus, let's come, come over here. Let's have a talk. And he takes him aside and begins to give Jesus the, let me tell you how it's going to be kind of story. You know what I'm saying? This is, the, this is the king of the universe that you just pulled to the side and you're going to bring some correction to. He's probably not thinking real clearly because his mind is running so fast about what he heard and what he doesn't want to see happen that he has something to say about that. And so Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him. But when he had, had, when he had turned around and looked at the disciples, and, and you've got to get the whole picture here, Peter pulls him out in front of everybody. Hey, let's have a talk. It's obvious that Peter's going to give him the what if, you know, let me tell you how I think it should go. And then Jesus turns back to his disciples like, guys, are y'all, are y'all believing this? Are y'all seeing this? Really? Peter's going to tell me how this is really going to go down. And so he says, he, Jesus, when he had turned around and looked at the disciples, then he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, what he was addressing was a spirit that had risen up on the inside of Peter. Peter had a good heart, loved the Lord, but Peter didn't always engage his heart and his mind together, and more importantly, maybe engage with the spirit and his heart and his mind. And so he's beginning to speak out of the flesh and out of the, <coughs> excuse me, soul, mind, will, and emotions. So he's thinking, I don't want this to happen, and I have something to say about this, and if it has anything to do with me, I'm not going to allow this to happen. And yet, he needs to be tuned into God, what are you saying right now? And if, God, you're saying this, then I have to begin to embrace this and wrap my mind around it. What does this look like? What does this mean for us? But it would have done him better if he would have just listened. Maybe Jesus would have continued to talk. Maybe there would have been more to the story. But Peter was so uh, maybe shocked by what was being said. I think he just kind of interrupted the whole moment. Hey, we've got to have a conversation over here before you go any farther. It's going to happen. The things that God has talked about, the things that God has promised, they're going to happen. We ought to just listen a little bit more and try to talk a little bit less because the more we talk, generally, the more we get in trouble. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you've ever been like this. Sometimes when someone's talking to me, I get so caught up in what they've said and about what I'm about to say that I'm really not even listening anymore to what they're saying. Ever been there? Your mind's already engaged in the conversation you're about to have, and so you've already cut off their conversation, and you're just waiting for them to just take a breath so you can just jump right in there and then take the conversation. Maybe I'm the only one that's ever done that. <laughs> I'm guilty with my wife sometimes because she's telling me something. I, I'm, I'm, here comes the comeback. I mean, like, I, this is my perspective. And then she's like, you're not even listening to me. I'm like, you're right. You know, if you would just wait a minute and listen to me, in other words, let me share what's on my heart, get a full understanding of the whole picture before you devise the plan on how you're going to fix it or the strategy or the comeback or whatever it is. Uh, many times, the more we talk, the more we get in trouble. I, I remember one time there was a, we had a rental property and a family came over and there was a man there and he wanted to rent our uh, rent, rent house. And so he's like, man, I'm, I'm ready to do it right now. Of course, we don't just let the first person that walks in the door rent the property. I mean, there's an application. There's a little bit of, you know, process that you go through. I've got the money, and I'm ready right now. Where do I sign? I was like, well, you know, let's talk about this for a moment. Here's an application. Fill that out. Tell me a little bit about where you're coming from. Well, you know, I, I, I got kicked out of my last place. <laughs> Red flag. <laughs> and uh, he's like, me and my landlord, we never got along. I mean, he, he always wanted me to pay my rent on time, and he was always coming by to check in. And, and I'm like, okay. And then he's like, and there was a few things that he never would fix. And I told him, I'm not paying you another dime until you come fix these things. I'm thinking, man, the more you talk, the less I want you to rent my property. 
You'd have been better off just saying, I'd like to rent this place, fill out your little application, and let's just see what happens than to say this and then this and then this. I'm like, man, you're burying yourself. Stop. And I thought, Lord, sometimes I probably do that. Get excited and just keep talking and just keep talking. And then like, why didn't I just keep my mouth shut? I would have been so much better off, right? King David says it like this in Psalms 141.3. Take control of what I say, O Lord, and keep my lips sealed. Wow, we got to grab a hold of one of the, that scripture and put it in our heart. It's not a common one probably to memorize. I haven't heard anybody say, hey, we're going to memorize uh, Psalms 141.3 today. Take control of what I say, O Lord, and keep my lips sealed. My Texas translation says, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Lord, please help me keep my mouth shut. That's scripture right there. We can go back and say, hey, I learned a new scripture today. It says, Lord, help me keep my mouth shut. There's so much wisdom in that. Man, we think a lot of things. And many times we say, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. Well, then just don't say it. If we, if we think it and it's not right, and, and there's already that pause that we shouldn't say it, then please let us not say it. Psalms 19, 14 says, May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart. Lord, let those things that are coming out of my mouth, first of all, the filter should be, Lord, is this pleasing to you? Because if it's not pleasing to you, there's, there's something wrong with it. And he says, the thoughts of my heart. You know, years ago, I, I saw, uh, uh, I heard a message about the thoughts of our heart. Now, scientists say our brain thinks and our heart just pumps blood, right? But all throughout scripture, it talks about the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. So somehow our heart and our mind is connected. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so within our heart, if our heart is evil, then out comes evil. If our heart is good, then out comes good. And so if what's coming out of our mouth is not pleasing to God, it probably stems even a little bit deeper. What's in our heart is not pleasing to God. Lord, help me. My heart is not right. If my heart was right, I wouldn't be saying those things that are not pleasing to you because my heart would be aligned with his heart. And so when I think of it like that, then the things that I would say would probably be covered with so much more grace and so much more mercy and so much more kindness because how does God speak to us? Even when we failed royally, most of us honestly do not hear God just giving you one after another and just tearing you down and telling you how bad the enemy is quick to come and be the accuser of the brethren and try to ruin you and crush you and make you feel terrible. But you know, that's not God's heart and God's voice. When God comes on our worst day, when we feel like we failed and we've messed up so bad that nothing could ever be salvaged. And God says, I still love you and I care about you. And I'm going to have mercy on you. And you're like, no, God, I don't deserve it. I know you don't, but I love you anyway. And, and like, God, why are you like that? That's how big his heart is towards us. He's so merciful. His, his mercies are new every morning. In other words, he's like, you know what? Let's not go to bed with wrath. Let's not go to bed with things from yesterday. The Bible says, hey, if you got things or ought against one another, maybe even ought with God, then we ought to just come to a, a conclusion and, and decide, you know what? I'm not going to bed until we get this settled. Why? Because God says, I want to be able for you to wake up the next day and have a brand new beginning because I've got new grace and new mercy for you for a brand new day. You can't go back and fix yesterday. You can just relive a new day, a, a day called tomorrow. And so I, I love that because with that in mind, if, our, if what's coming out of our mouth is not pleasing the Lord, we have to go back to our heart and say, God, help my heart. Evidently, it's not right where it needs to be either. But when it is, then those things that come out of our mouth begin to edify and encourage and build up. We become the voice of the Lord in the earth around us. Isn't that what was, Jessica was saying earlier about loving people and being the light to others and sharing the gospel? What is the gospel? The good news of Jesus. Those words of mercy and grace and kindness. And so our heart actually thinks. And so we need to search our hearts and say, God, is my heart right with you? Is it pleasing to you? Many times we get upset and say things, and, and I've, I've said it, you've probably said it, 
you've said things that you shouldn't have said, and you say, I really didn't mean it, you know, and I think that times there's some of that, but honestly, if we really check ourselves, if these things are coming out, if these things are being said, we probably meant them in some way. We didn't want them to hurt as bad as they did. We didn't want them to come across maybe as harsh as they did, but that feeling stems from something. And so I was just joking, but were we? Were we really joking, or did or what was inside accidentally, accidentally spilled out, and now we can't take it back? You know, I wish at times I could just take back a few words like replay, rewind. I, even when I was younger, and they probably have them now, but I thought there needs to be this thing called a take back app so that when you're texting something that you shouldn't text, that on your phone, if you have the app, it gives you like a 30-second buffer. So all your texts just have a 30 second. Somebody's going to be a millionaire if that doesn't exist because <laughs> all your texts just have a 30-second delay. So I'll tell them what I'm thinking. Boop, 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 bing, see, and then you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I got the Take Back app. I just like, within 30 seconds, I could decline that and pull it back and rethink about it because many times we respond out of frustration and then we say, wow, I, sh I shouldn't have said that and it's too late. People live their whole lives in regrets, pay a price much greater than they ever wanted to pay because of something they said. One wrong conversation, one losing of our temper and saying the wrong thing at the wrong time and you lose your job or it brings divide in the family or among the children and it's, it's difficult. Lord, help us. And the whole process we're talking about is just learning how to be slow to speak. You know, we shouldn't have to take something back if we didn't say it so quickly. If we were a little bit slower in our delivery, we'd have had time to process and say, as I'm slowly responding to this situation, I've given myself a little bit of time to think, this is probably not the best response that I should be sending. This is not the thing that I should be saying. And so before I finish this thought and let it become a conversation, I'm going to hold it right there. And I'm not going to say I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm going to think I probably shouldn't say this, so I'm not going to say it. And I'm just going to smile, and I can't help but think it sometimes. But the Bible says take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So that thought rises up. Maybe even the enemy comes in and says, you should tell them what you think. No, I shouldn't. <laughs> That's not going to help this situation. I've got a little more wisdom that you'd think that we would have learned by now, right? Because we've probably all failed at this more than once and we're not as young as we used to be. So after several times, we'd say, hey, I got this. I'm going to keep my mouth shut, <laughs> but we don't. We went to dinner with a couple the other night and they're uh, pastors at another church in the Metroplex. We've been friends for some time. And it's just good as pastors sometimes to get with other pastors that don't know the congregation, don't know the world fully that you're in, to just be real and open and say, I'm carrying a lot or I'm going through a lot. And it's just like, it's, it's like healing, you know? It's just like, I'm not talking bad about things. I just need to be real and honest and say, hey, life sometimes is a struggle and it's difficult and just be praying with us. And it seems like with this couple, many times I carry most of the conversation. And I told them when we sat down the night, listen, we're actually doing really good, so I'm not going to do a lot of talking about how are y'all doing. Let's talk about y'all tonight. And before it was over, we're talk I'm doing most of the talking again. I'm like, what, what am I doing? I said I wasn't going to do this. I've got, to, and I'm preaching this. I've been studying this. Like, look in the mirror. Get it. You can get this. You can, you can win this. James 3.8 but no man, this, this is scripture too, okay? No man can tame the tongue. So it's not an easy thing. It's a very unruly member. It's unruly evil, the Bible calls it, full of deadly poison. With it, we'll bless, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. He's saying, listen, that, that tongue of yours, it's hard to tame it. And so if we can't tame the tongue, it's unruly, it's dangerous. 
then we say, well, I can't tame that. In other words, it's going to just keep spitting things out. So all I can do is shut my lips to keep my tongue from being able to say what it wants to say, right? I thought about a water spigot, and I meant to bring one as an example because that water valve, when opened fully, it just releases naturally what's in the line. It's just going to come out. And so if you don't want it coming out, you have to shut the valve off. Or at least if you want it coming out slowly, you've got to crank it down a few notches so that it doesn't throw so much out. And truthfully, our hearts are probably not fully where they need to be. And our hearts are not in a place where we can fully trust that what I'm going to say every time is going to be the right thing. Now, most of the time, I, I think we do well, but there's still a little of that sin nature sometimes that that is got a little bit of pride or selfishness or or feel like, well, I've been done wrong, so hurt people hurt people. And that's not right. Jesus says when someone strikes you on the cheek, turn and let them strike the other cheek. Like, in other words, don't try to defend yourself. Don't try to fight with one another. Do everything that you can to, to walk in grace and keep the bond of peace with one another. Because at the end of the day, the Bible says we're all a part of the body of Christ. And so the only option is, is to cut your arm off because you can't get along. And you're going to regret that later. So, so if God says, I put you together, you're stuck with each other. The best thing to do is for us to like learn how to keep our mouth shut and work this thing out. Be filled up with the love of God. So the love of God comes out. And so he says the tame, it's a da- the tongue, it's a dangerous thing. We have to be careful. And so if we can't tame it, then we just have to shut off the valve, close the lips and not release everything that wants to come spewing out. Amen. So I hear sometimes people say, you know, Pastor, it's not like you think at the house. Uh, we're, not as, we're not as sweet talking as we are at church. And the things that come out of our mouths at home is a little different than what we talk about at church. And you probably wouldn't like to hang out at our house very long because sometimes we say things that wouldn't be pleasant to the ears. Listen, I, I'm all about true confessions, but the reality is those things should not be. We should not come to church and be one way and go home and live another I I grew up in that environment, and many of you know what I'm talking about. We need the Lord, so we come into this atmosphere, and we say, God, help us. And then we go back into a totally different culture and atmosphere. And it's not pleasing to God, and it's not healthy and wholesome, and it's not building the family and growing the family strong. It's tearing down the family. And so I want you to continue to come to church, but let's let's learn from Scripture what he's trying to say, and, and let's go back and practice it in our own homes. So is this edifying and uplifting to God? If Jesus was here today, would I be saying these things? Guess what? If you're born again, Jesus is here today. He's sitting there going, I can't believe you're talking like this. You shouldn't be. And yet we say, you know, just sit over there for a minute while I take care of this. Most of the time we don't even acknowledge the fact that he's in the room with us when these things are happening. <laughs> Lord, help us. Being slow to speak is really the way to check the condition of our heart and and, and if being slow to speak is a filter, then we can monitor, wow, good things are coming up. I'm having great thoughts. I want to say this. I want to I want to bless them. Ooh, I'm not having great thoughts. I'm going to keep this back. And I'm not just going to not say it. I'm going to realize I should have even had those thoughts. Lord, help me. Let me see others like you see them. Let me have the kind of response that you would have. Because our words can heal or our words can hurt. We can build up or we can tear down. And it takes so much longer to rebuild something after it's torn down. Kind words are amazing. Words that hurt sometimes last a lifetime. People, people still live in their life as a consequence of words that were spoken over them when they were young. That may not have even been true, but they believed them. They heard them. They were fed those words, and it affected their life going forward. So Paul says, slow down enough to put some... Uh, let me read this, Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Think about this. Before I release the words that are coming out of my mouth, everything deserves grace. So I got, before I can deliver this, what I, my conversation, I have to put a little grace on this. So that's what the word says. 
So before I feed you the words that are coming out of my mouth, I have to put some grace on them so they can be received. And i got to put a little seasoning on them. Otherwise, it could leave a bad taste in your mouth. The words that I'm speaking over you could leave you in a, in have a, having a bad taste in your mouth. So before I deliver them, I've got to put some grace on these words, and I've got to season them so that they'll be well-received. My daughter called last night. She was on her anniversary. They've been married two years now, I think. She got married uh, the day before the COVID uh, mandate that went down to 10 people. We had just gone down to 50 people. Uh, and so her wedding was like three weeks away and it crushed her like, I'm not going to have a wedding. And she wouldn't have for a long time. But so it went down to 50 people and tomorrow, the Friday night that we were on a Thursday night, Friday night, it was going down to 10 people after midnight. And she's like, I'm not going to get to get married. Your daughter's crying and having this big ordeal. She, we make a decision to have a wedding tomorrow night before midnight <laughs> And we put together a 24-hour wedding for my daughter with 50 of our closest friends, and we have her a wedding. Two years later, she's celebrating um, the wedding, and I've got to get back to where I was going with this story. Because <laughs> it was good. It had a good point to it. Oh, this is where it was, the seasoning. She calls last night, and someone had given them a $50 gift card uh, for their anniversary, I think one of her family members. And so they went to a steakhouse and ate steak. Well, she called and said, Dad. That was terrible. I'm like, what? She's like, it had no flavor, and it was tough, and, and we used our whole gift card, and we were so excited. I said, why is that? And she's like, because we've got used to the steaks that you cook at home, and they're nothing like that. I'm like, well, we can get them for a whole lot less than $50. <laughs> Maybe it's all in the way you cook them, but she said it was just so bland and it had no flavor. I'm like, she was going by the taste of that steak made all the difference in the world. Maybe it was the same steak. One had flavor. One did not. Maybe the words that we speak would be so much more well-received if they had some seasoning on them. You could say it this way, and it'd just be flat and dry and bland and maybe not even well-received at all. Or I could season it up a little bit and put a little grace on it, and they say, man, they love me. I love it when they speak into my life. I, I just, it's, it's always greatness, right? It's all in how we deliver the message. Philippians 4 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, I mean, he's really getting detailed here. Whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. He says, I want you to be thinking on these great things. Why? Because those things that we meditate on, get down into our heart. And if we put the right things in, we're going to get the right things out. It's say garbage in, garbage out. We want blessings in and blessings out. Amen. And so maybe we're paying too much attention to the negativity of this world, all the negative news. There's rarely any good news on anymore. It's about this shooting and that car wreck and this and that. And I'm like, you know, news shouldn't all be bad news, right? But it seems to be that way. And Maybe the work culture that we live in and the people that we surround ourselves with, we're fed sometimes with all this negativity and worldliness. When God says, set your affections on things above and not on things of this earth and meditate on these things. Let your mind and your heart be filled with all these things. And, and, and then I believe what needs to come out will begin to come out. Luke 6.45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the man's, a man speaks. So let me leave you with three really important points to that as we get ready to close. The first one is this. Think before you speak. Think before you speak. I'm going to say something. I have something to say. I want to inject right here. But before I do, I'm going to remember it's important for me to think before I speak. Make sure that whatever you're about to say is seasoned with love. Does it have a little grace on it? Does it have a little seasoning in it? Is, is it going to be something that I could receive well before I give it to them? This works with your spouse. This works with your children. This works at work. This works in the church. With just anyone and everyone, the things that we say, is this seasoned with love and grace? And if it's that hard, then ask the Holy Spirit, how would you say it? 
or what would you say? It, it's just, you know, I'd say that take back app where we could pull it back. How about we not pull, have something that pull it back? How, can, how about we have something that just delays our release? So that before it's released, we have that. I want to think about this just for a moment. Now, is this going to be seasoned in love and grace? And Holy Spirit, what do you say? I listened to a great podcast this week on leadership. And it was talking about uh, having conflict and conflict and leadership go together. If great leaders come together, there's generally conflict because they all have an opinion. They all have an idea. And so everybody's got a direction they want to go. In organizations like this, when we're multi-campus and multi-pastors and, and so many things happening at once, we all have to come together and submit and humble ourselves one to another and say, look, we all have the same heart to grow the kingdom of heaven. And it's not about any one of us. It's about him. So how can we submit all of these great ideas and then begin to build on some of these together and not just see one uh, side of the, the situation or through one set of lenses? And so, but it was talking about with conflict and um, being able to, to, to uh, speak to one another and, and asking the Holy Spirit before you go into a situation, even maybe to deal with a person that you've had conflict with. We want to go in and say, hey, I didn't like the way you did this or you should have done this differently. We have to say, Holy Spirit, what do you think about this person? And what do you want to say to this person? Because when we go into a situation with that mindset, he says, well, I love them and I've got a great call on their life. And I know they're a bonehead sometimes. He doesn't use that word probably, but I know they're a struggle sometimes. But they're still my child and I love them. And you give me struggle sometimes as well. Yeah, you're right. And so I just want you to bring the correction that needs to be brought. But I want you to bring it with kindness and gentleness and love. I want you to do it to them as you would want me to do it to you. So when we filter that through Holy Spirit, what would you like to say? It changes the way we begin to communicate with one another. And we're a little slower to speak and we deliver our words with more caution. The second point is this. Think before you speak. Wait a minute. Wasn't that the first point? Yeah. It's the second point also. Think before you speak. I want you to catch this in that. Proverbs 18, 19. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a castle. In other words, a few wrong words can cost you so much that you offend someone, it's so difficult to repair that breach, to win them back again because of the words that have been said. There are hundreds, literally thousands of people that struggle to ever go back inside the doors of a church again. Because some human being attending church said the wrong thing to them and they were offended and they're very hard to win. And it doesn't always have to even come from a platform or from the pastor. Someone sitting beside them one day said, hey, that's my chair and uh, no one else sits in my chair. And you say, oh, that wouldn't happen. It happens all the time. I've talked to people that says, man, what, 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 have you ever been in church? Yeah, but I'm not doing that again. What happened? Man, I've been going there for like two or three years. And I couldn't come every week, but I came pretty, pretty often. And I happened to sit down, and I thought I knew pretty much everybody in the church. I sit down in a chair, and someone comes over and says, excuse me, that's our seat. You need to sit somewhere else. I'm like, what? I'm like, no, seriously, I'm not joking. You need to sit somewhere else. I'm like, is this really how it's going to be? And then he said, I got to look at it. He's like, I can start seeing this kind of stuff woven within the church. I'm like, I don't want to be a part of stuff like that. And so I'm not going anymore. And so little things that we do that are not right offend people and cause them to be out of the kingdom maybe forever or at least for a long time. And so we've got to be careful not to be offensive with our words, the things we say. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Wow, what a scripture. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So we can bring life into a situation by the words that we speak. Or we can destroy someone by the words. That's how, that's how powerful these words are. They build up and they tear down. They set someone into their destiny, into their calling, into their potential. Or they wreck them sometimes for a lifetime. So point number two being clearly think before you speak. And let me give you point number three. You may already know what's coming. 
think before you speak. I, I write these messages for myself. You just get to hear them the second time through because I'm like, Lord, that's, that's what I need to learn. First Thessalonians 5.11, therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. So our words need to be comforting and edifying. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Sometimes you say, well, I'm right. I have the right to say it. Well, even if you're right and you have the right to say it, will your words bless someone or hurt someone? Is it okay to just not say it even though you're right? I've met people that will just fight to the end because it's just the matter of principle. Oh, man, we had all this falling out over a matter of principle. Was it really worth it? So, so you're right. So, so I don't take out the trash enough or the yard wasn't mowed to perfection or the laundry didn't quite hit the hamper or... <laughs> people, people separate ways from these little things that are so divisive because it's a matter of principle. It's the way it should be, at least from my perspective. Um, we should think before we do a lot of things, but we should think before we speak. Amen? Now, if words can tear down and they can be so harmful, as I said, words can also bring life and build up. And we ought to start practicing that more than the other because we live in a world of tearing each other down. In fact, there's, I don't know if it still exists, but for some times there was, uh, I don't even know what they call it, but it's, it was where the, where the kids were pretty much just tearing each other down and saying these terrible things about each other. It was kind of a fad, and they, they had, a, had a word for it. I'm like, what? Robert may can help us. What is it? Roasting. Yeah, roasting each other. There was some, uh, something like that where it's just like it's cool to, to really make you look bad and to say all these terrible things about you and everybody's laughing and it's really almost bullying, but you know, but they thought it's cool and, uh, and they'd laugh about it. And I'm like, no, these words are hurting. I don't care if you like it or not. These words, but it was a, it was the thing. I'm like, this is extremely dangerous, but the culture is we live in a cancel culture. You, I mean, like if they don't like what you say, they just shut you down. Well, that's harmful in itself. You know, and now the powers to be, if, if, you don't, if they don't like what you say, they could shut all of us down. I mean, we live on social media and our phones and everything. I, I don't do social media much, but as a church, we, we have a website and we host our services and people listen. Listen, we've, we, we've been shut down multiple times, not for saying the wrong things, but, and we have copyright. We pay a lot of money for copyright protection and be able to play things. But on social media sites, if a song, sometimes our group is, is so good. And that's not me. I'm bragging on them because I don't do that stuff. But sometimes they can be so good that social media can shut you down because it thought you were playing a song that belonged to someone else. And so er, you're done. And like, you have to wait and you have to uh, uh, petition and you have to like, please give us permission to go back online. I mean, like they're monitoring all this like, what, we just canceled you. And it's all, about, uh, it's all about royalties and rights and all these things, but they control. If, if, if you're a leader and you're, you're leading too many people in a direction they don't want you to go, well, then they can just shut you down and you don't have leadership on a platform anymore. But on the flip side, if we have the power to lift up and build up and encourage, it doesn't have to be on a social media platform. It can be one-on-one. -on -one. It could be in a room like this to say, you know what, James, thank you for showing up on a Saturday night and doing what you do so we can have words and we can have announcements and we can have everything because that's a blessing, you know, and, and, it, and all these things that happen and just to thank you ladies that come, that have walked through difficult times and say, you know what, it's not going to affect my faith. I'm still going to serve God. I'm still going to keep my faith in God. I'm still going to trust God because that's what I'm called to do. And I'm going to let God heal me and make me whole going forward, but I'm still going to be used by God. And, and thank you for having faith to say our, our grandkids are in serious situations right now. and We need help, and let's begin to pray. The church begins to pray, and we see miracles. Honestly, we see miracles as kids are safe from destruction because of God's hand of grace. Thank you for being a part of the local church so we can carry some of these burdens together. 
You know, we ought to look around and, and appreciate one another and begin to tell one another how much we enjoy them being here and how much they bless us and how much they mean to us. Too often those things are said to a, to a fiberglass box and some flowers and the person never gets to hear them. When we ought to be going around and lifting each other up and building each other up and, and getting to know people beyond surface level so that we can find out the reason that they're where they're at is because of the things that were spoken over them. And we could say, that's not true at all. That's not how I see you. You're a blessing. You're not, you're not that way. This is what God says about you. And, and I think if we would just be slow to speak, it would give us more time to let the Holy Spirit really download in us, not what we should say, what, what's in my heart to say, but what's in his heart to say. I'm about to say something to this person, and then we just give it a, a, a moment within our heart and our mind to say, but God, what would you like me to say to this person? And then we almost can become prophetic, which is really just a channel for the voice of God to flow through us. So it's no longer what I have to say, but now I become a mouthpiece for, for God himself into the earth that could possibly change a person's life forever. In fact, I, I'm not going to say possibly. I'm going to say any time we hear God and deliver that message, it will change a person's life. I can't think of any time that someone came and gave me a word that I knew was from God that didn't have a deep impact on me. Even if it was just a small word that said, God is so pleased with you. Thank you. I needed that because I'm not real pleased with myself right now. But I'm glad to hear that he is. That encourages me. I can keep going. Would you stand to your feet this evening? So remember the three points. Think before you speak. Think before you speak. Think before you speak. I think we can do that. What, what was it again? Think before you speak. You guys are amazing. Let's, let's bow our heads. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that, that you're speaking to us. And that, Lord, we will slow down and be slow to speak because you ask us to for a greater good. Our mouths do get us in so much trouble, Father. In fact, as I reflect on just speaking, even right now as we pray, many times in prayer we do all the talking and very little listening. Lord, as we practiced a few weeks ago, let us stop and do more listening than talking. And as we have conversations with friends and family and even strangers, we wouldn't be in such a hurry to say so many things, but that we would let our minds have a chance to hear by the Spirit what you want to say, Father. That the few words that we say would have more impact than the multitudes of words that we once said. Let us speak words that bless you and that bless others that edify and exalt you and that edify and exalt others. And I just pray for that anointing upon your church, this congregation and all of our congregations, that we step into a season that we realize it's not how much we say, but what we say that's so important. So that we could say less, yet say more all at the same time by just being slow to speak. I just want to take a moment and just allow God to search your heart. I just want to, I want you to see him with a flashlight, just kind of walking around the inner person that you are and the thoughts and the conversations within you, the motives, the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever. Let him just kind of look around in there and highlight something that you've already known shouldn't be in your heart this would be a good time for us to say God I, I'd like to offload that right now give it to you and let you speak to me about this
slipped in here tonight and maybe you're just not in a good place with God. Maybe you and the Lord have had a falling out. You're just not on speaking terms, but you want to be here. Maybe you've just never known God and didn't even know it was possible to hear from God. I'm telling you, God will speak to you so clearly. It'll shock you how clear you can hear God. If you fall into one of those categories where you want to know God or want to just reconnect with God, just, just wave at me quickly. Everybody else's heads are bowed. I want to pray with you tonight before we close. Give you an opportunity to leave tonight in a better place. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we're grateful for your mercies. Lord, I thank you that even in these few moments you spoke to my heart some things I need to adjust. You love us enough to be honest with us. And Lord, help us to be honest with you. Lord, I thank you for your hand that's been upon so many this week, Lord, for Lord, for Ransom and Jackson, Lord, and for Rio this week is, Lord, it just seemed so tragic in the moment, and yet, God, your mercies were so great. You really quickly came to their rescue and, and got them out of harm's way. I pray continued healing upon them and a speedy recovery. And, Lord, let this be one of those moments that they reflect back on and say, God really touched my life in that season, and I really got focused at a young age that God had a plan for me and he kept me from destruction he saved me for a purpose and Lord with all of us let us reflect back to the times that you have rescued us from ourself or situations because there's so much more that you want to do in us and through all of us so I pray for the giftings and the callings that are inside each and every one here to not lay dormant any longer but I pray blow upon them and stir those afresh and anew in our hearts that those hidden talents and gifts, conversations, talents, whatever they are, Father, they would come forth and they'd begin to be used for your glory. Even if they seem simple or insignificant, Lord, nothing is insignificant with you. And so I push this congregation into their destiny, into their calling, as you pushed us into this region to win a region for the kingdom. I pray this summer season would be a catalyst for revival like we never imagined. That we outgrow this building so fast that soon and very soon, not only would we go to Sunday mornings, but we'd be going to a new location because you open up doors of opportunity for us. We thank you for that. Continue to deal with our hearts this week as we purpose to listen more and to be slow to speak. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Listen, before we dismiss, if you need ministry, I'm going to be here at the altar. There'll be a few more here at the altar. We'll pray for you. Whatever you need prayer for, don't hesitate to come be in the altar and get some prayer. And I just want to bless you as you go. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday evening. Father, thank you for this incredible group of young men and women, as I like to say, because we're all young uh, men and women in this room. Every one of you, Father, I pray blessings upon them and their families, upon our health, upon everything we put our hands to, Lord. Just bless it, Lord. You even allow us to release the blessing. So I bless you in the name of Jesus. May God bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he continue to lift up his countenance upon you as he already has done so graciously. And may you walk in a level of peace that others say, how do you have so much peace? when no one else does. Lord, I thank you that you give us a peace that goes beyond anyone's human understanding. A peace that allows us to sleep at night knowing, God, everything's all right because you're in control. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a great evening.